Mute yourself. Hello. Buonasera. Hello. Dovremmo essere live. Dovremmo essere live e, e dovremmo essere pronti per uh, partire con questo uh, nuovo appuntamento. Io sono Linda Di Pietro, responsabile del programma artistico e culturale di base. Uh, base Milano, centro culturale ibrido che nasce nel 2016 all'interno degli edifici dell'ex Ansaldo. E, um, oggi diamo vita a Playground, eh, che è un campo da gioco immaginifico, che si concretizzerà da oggi in poi in un ciclo di conversazioni, di percorsi di ricerca, di residenze artistiche, fisiche e uh, di incontri virtuali negli spazi chiusi ma non vuoti di base. È proprio su questo principio dell'essere chiusi forzatamente, ma non voler essere vuoti, che nasce questa riflessione. Saranno tre mesi di um, lavoro sulla comunità, sulla creazione di una comunità di artiste ed artisti, di architette e architetti, di ricercatrici e ricercatori, di lavoratrici e lavoratori della cultura, che saranno le prese con le tante domande che sono alla base del nostro programma futuro. Ci siamo chiesti perché e vi potrete in tanti chiedere perché perché ci sono tante iniziative su Zoom, perché un'altra, le nostre vite sono già riversate su queste piattaforme. Ebbene, ehm, abbiamo sentito il desiderio di aprire l'istituzione culturale, ehm, di aprire le conversazioni che solitamente teniamo dietro le quinte, di renderle pubbliche, di rendere pubbliche quelle questioni che accompagnano la nascita di un programma culturale di percorsi che poi abitano fisicamente lo spazio, che poi incontrano fisicamente un pubblico e che troppo spesso nelle istituzioni tradizionali restano chiusi, restano chiusi dietro le porte delle sale prove, restano chiusi dietro le porte delle sale espositive, restano chiusi dietro le quinte. Ecco, eh, per noi è importante in questo momento storico aprire l'istituzione culturale, eh, renderla esposta, in qualche modo anche vulnerabile, eh, e per farlo vogliamo concentrarci su come stiamo lavorando insieme, insieme intendo insieme come gruppo di lavoro ma insieme anche con gli artisti eh, e con le tante anime e individualità e gruppi e collettivi che si susseguiranno in questi incontri che, che cominciano oggi. Playground nasce poi da una serie di congiunzioni astrali, nasce dall'incontro con Robert Montgomery che oggi ci ha raggiunto Uh, qui online e dalla sua opera che abbiamo installato sulla grande facciata d'ingresso uh, di base e che ha dato il via ad un nuovo percorso per noi dedicato alla creazione artistica nello spazio pubblico. Questo programma in particolare nasce da una domanda, che cosa può fare l'arte negli spazi ad essa deputata ma soprattutto cosa può fare l'arte al di fuori di questi spazi e cosa può fare l'arte tra lo spazio in cui è deputata e quello in cui non lo è nello spazio di mezzo, nella terra di mezzo, in questo playground appunto. Base immagina quindi il ruolo dell'arte come ciò che eccede dal proprio limite e incontra la città. Per questo abbiamo voluto dedicare quell'opera, l'opera The Future is an Invisible Playground, alla città. Smargina oltre lo spazio che solitamente la ospita per mettere in luce la complessità del rapporto tra arte e vita quotidiana. E ci fa domandare appunto come questa eccezionalità si relaziona con il mondo, con la realtà, con le persone che, che camminano. Eh, le opere che ospiteremo nei prossimi anni avranno quello stesso, um, quella stessa tendenza, cercheranno di abitare lo spazio pubblico passando attraverso l'asfalto, l'intonaco, le finestre che connettono il centro culturale alla città. Vorremmo quindi che Base cominciasse a parlare già quando attraversiamo quella soglia, quando affrontiamo il sottopasso, quando entriamo nel cortile, quando abitiamo quegli spazi. Lanciamo questa sfida a Robert oggi, ma la lanceremo ad altri artisti nazionali e internazionali per accendere sempre nuove prospettive, sempre diverse, sullo stesso luogo. 
Tinisco Qui, uh, we dive into our encounter. Uh, now we switch into English. Uh, I hope it's going to be easy for the audience to follow us. Uh, hello, Robert. Hello, Elena. We, I just wanted to give an overview, and it's in Italian for all our audience, to make them um, in to understand why we decided to start with this program and why we chose uh, your artwork and your intervention to start this uh, process. Let me say welcome then to Robert Montgomery, the artist who created for us the artwork The Future is an Invisible Playground, and Elena Arzani, a critique, art critique, Thank a curator you. and a photographer that we invited to make this conversation more lively than just me and, and Robert, because we know each other for some time now, and maybe it's much more interesting to also have a, a third eye to, to, to talk about our, our playground. I want to start with, with Robert uh, and say that we chose, and I chose Robert um, to work with, uh, because I think that the poetic visual experiment that is Um, working with uh, allows me to work on various levels. One is the level of the message, of course. Another one is the level of the language. And the third one is the level of the relationship with the surrounding context, with the city, with the public realm. Because while his work is uh, playing with the popularity of uh, the language aphorism, let's say, Uh, even if I know Robert is a little bit provoking, uh, it also tries to transport the, the nature of poetry into the public space, which is a romantic nature within a very harsh uh, realm, and uses the contradiction of the medium to do this. So it's also interesting to me that people that are not meant to encounter these Uh, piece of art actually bump into it and realizes it looking uh, to the sky, which is something that we don't do anymore. We always look our feet, we always look our uh, mobile phones. So the posture changes and it changes also the way we look at things. So to encounter the work of Robert Montgomery for me has always been a romantic encounter. And I'm very happy to have Robert here. I would love you, Robert, to tell us a little bit more about your artwork, uh, why this artwork for Milano, and to talk about this invisible playground uh, we are all in search of. Thank you, Robert. Hi, guys. Um, thank you for having me, first of all, Linda. Nice to meet you, Elena. Um, fantastic to work with you again, Linda. I love their first collaboration in Turney, and it's so nice to be together in Milan. I hoped I would be coming to Milano, where I have lots of friends, uh, and be able to see all of my favorite Italians, but in, instead I'm stuck in England, and that's a shame, but hopefully I get to come in the springtime. Um, well, I mean, my work in general, the idea of working with outdoor space, exactly as you say, I mean, it's, it's to create an accessibility, Um, outside of the gallery, outside of the, of the museum. I started working with outside space in, but well, I mean, I worked, I worked in the city um, as an art student. I, I went to an art college in Edinburgh. After I left my MFA, I was an artist in residence on the core program at the Museum of Fine Arts in Houston. And it was a really transformative experience for me. I had some of the best American artists as visiting professors like James Terrell and uh, Ronnie Horn and Jack Pearson and artists that I really loved. And I came out of that, but I, I was living essentially, my studio was in the museum, my apartment was next to the museum and I was part of this wonderful institution, but part of the institution, you know? When I came out of that and I moved back to London, I wanted to find a way of reaching the people who don't come to the museum, you know? And actually I started working with billboard space then and kind of hijacking billboards for poetry. And, you know, because I believe that in, in England, we call it the man in the street is perfectly capable of understanding contemporary art and poetry. I mean, it's not rocket science and they can get a really um, 
you know, a really first hand engagement with it if it's in public space. So um, I began really intensively working in London with billboards in 2004. And I started a series then called Words in the City at Night. And the idea would be the poems would appear on billboards overnight and you'd see them late at night and you wouldn't know what the work was. You wouldn't, well, you would think it wasn't advertising because it's too strange to be advertising, but also that the audience wouldn't know it's art. Um, they might think it's the rantings of a madman. And sometimes I'd, I'd, I'd use different voices and different tones of voice. Um, and just to create that great area where the audience would encounter the work and they wouldn't really be sure what it is. They wouldn't know if it's art or not. They wouldn't know if it's advertising or not. And they would be kind of have to encounter it for, for just the text and for itself. Hi, Robert. Nice to meet you. Um, before we dig into a uh, reflection of your artwork themselves, I'd like um, to make a reflection with you about um, the meaning of the word playground. You may not be aware that the translation in Italian language is quite limited when compared to the British one. In fact, we translate literally playground as the place where you, you can actually play games only. But um, I'd like the public to understand and actually that embrace a wider complexity that um, can be transferred to your work itself. Uh, let's say it's, uh, it's about music, it's about performance and theater, it's about much more than, than what it is in Italian language. Um, yeah, I mean, for me, the work has two lines. It has the title of the piece, which is, and, and then it has the text in the piece. So the title of the piece is, the future is a risk of our hearts. The future is an invisible playground. Um, so actually it's about, you know, it's about looking, the future is a risk of our hearts is about the collective hope we have always to build a better future. Um, you know, it's been a tough year for everyone across the world and coming back from the sort of crisis we've had will be like a challenge also an opportunity to rebuild our world in a more ecological way, which is a very important part of this opportunity, I think. But also, um, you know, this idea of freedom, uh, this idea of being free in the city is an idea that has been really challenged this year because of lockdowns and stuff. And it's been a very difficult um, um, year for people in cities, you know, and, and those of us who live in cities, it's been a very great challenge because the things that give us joy and in a way freedom in a city music theater restaurants bars all those things have been kind of you know stopped in their tracks and so that's been difficult so in a way it's hoping for that time when the music returns you know and it's hoping for that time when we go to concerts again and we dance all night and we leave the concert with our feet sore and we stumble home in our bare feet in the in the rain smiling um sure. Talking about music, I know it's a component that actually inspired your work and that you base the rhythm of your writing on, on the same way songs are written, the lyrics. Yeah, I think, think about that a lot. I mean, I, well, I think, I think about the way uh, words are used in music by great lyric writers like Bob Dylan or Leonard Cohen or Joni Mitchell or, or you know, those great classic 60s uh, lyricists. Well, the way that the words and the music are combined, I think about that in terms of finding an equivalent way to combine the words and the visual identity of the words, you know? So of course my work's related to a tradition of concrete poetry in a way, which goes back to Guillaume Apollinaire in 1910 in Paris when he wrote Alcools. Um, the first concrete poems, and then also uh, to a tradition of text art, which the great sort of grandmasters of that are people like Lawrence Wiener and Jenny Holzer. And then with my work, I sort of was fascinated by maybe taking where the text artists of the previous generation got to and saying, okay, you know, where is the space here for a tone of voice that's like poetry? 
and a tone of voice that's musical or has a musicality to it. Um, yeah, so you're correct, for sure. I, I would say that um, some of your works, if not most of them, actually embodies a sort of melancholy that we could, in a way, uh, transfer to even the British weather. I mean, you very much translate uh, your biography into an artwork. Interesting. Well, yeah, I mean, I come from Scotland, so we have a lot of weather. And I grew up on the West Coast, which is the coast looking out towards Ireland, which is a very mythical coast, you know, full of like Celtic myth and a lot of wind and rain. Um, but the weather is something I write about a lot in my work in cities because I find that in a city, the weather is the thing that makes you remember you're on the land and makes you remember that you connected with nature. My view of cities is not that they are um, not natural, you see. My view of cities is that they are, um, we build them the way that bees build beehives, right? So our cities are like the beehives of humans. And so we don't think of a beehive as being not part of the natural world. So we should really think of our cities as being part of the natural world that we have built and that we sort of live inside. There are homes, there are factories in a way, and there are places of adventure, you know? And, and uh, so I'm always thinking about the urban landscape from the point of view of thinking about it really as landscape. And I find that if you think about the weather, the wind, the rain, the sunshine, the shadows, then you, you experience the city with a, a new vividness. And I think the job of poetry is always to try to make us experience everyday life with an increased vividness and to try to find a sense of magic in the mundane, you know, to try to find God in the, in the mundane, if you like. That's very interesting. Thank you. Actually, um, that takes me to the next question, because I was wondering, since most of your artwork are displayed in metropolitan cities, because most of European cities such as Berlin, Geneva, and then now in Milan, and I was wondering if uh, for some reason you find inspiration in, in working in metropolitan cities. I mean, I mean, I do, and I've traditionally done a lot of work in big cities, but I mean, I've recently started doing work in, I've just done a, a, a new commission in Fort Smith, Arkansas, which is a very small city um, in, in the American South. Um, I've just done two projects in Arkansas, actually. I mean, I'm sort of, and I also do light poems and fire poems, sometimes in the desert, sometimes on the beach. You know, I think that um, as I'm getting older, the places my work is, I'm making work for are expanding a, li a little bit. You know, it started out being very urban places, just the, the square mile where I lived in East London, which is a kind of hard part of London. But um, no, I'm, you know, I'm always uh, thinking of new places. Um, yeah. I was thinking about, um particularly this year, actually, uh, where there's been um, the need for going into digital communication as soon as possible as to allow us to have a sort of uh, living experience which was closer to what we had to unfortunately give up uh, due to the pandemic. So I was wondering, in this kind of scenario where words have become fast consuming, to the point in which when we post something on social next, or we have to be very much aware of the length of what we are writing. Yeah. So I was wondering, do you think that there's still a need or sort of room for poetry? And if so, what kind of meaning would have poetry nowadays in your opinion? Well, I mean, actually I think digital culture is not bad for poetry because Poetry is a language of economy and a lot of what you do as a poet is you write something long and then you're trying to condense it, condense it down, 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 down to get to the essence of the meaning. Um, I think modernism in poetry was really about that, you know, that idea of condensing into the essence. Um, if you look at The Wasteland by T.S. Eliot, which is, in my opinion, the best poem of the 20th century, uh, people might argue, but I think perhaps, um, that poem was edited right down to 
almost 60% of its original length by Ezra Pound, who became Elliot's editor. And that idea of condensing to the essence is, has been really important in poetry in the last hundred years, for sure. Um, so I think, so I think poetry can survive on these new social media platforms like Instagram, etc. Um, you know, my wife Greta Belamachina publishes her work with an American publisher called Andrews McNeil, who are publishing a new generation of predominantly female poets, and they're using Instagram sometimes as the the main platform for the poetry. Um, and with some of the poets, they publish the books are almost a secondary thing, you know, and that's interesting. Um, however, I must say this new reliance on digital communication and only meeting people with Zoom calls, etc., frightens me to death. And I think that I think that if you if you think about what someone like Guy Debord would think of this kind of way of um, this distanced digital society we're living in currently he would find it so frightening and he would find it, it to be the the next stage of the spectacle you know i think that from that from that point of view from the from the power politics between the spectacle and the individual these things are you know a disaster this is the spectacle living not just in our living rooms like we had tv before the spectacle would come into your living room the spectacle being the alliance between you know um the media advertising and political power you'd have that coming into your tv into your live into your home into your room now we have it living on our bodies you know and i'm just as bad i'm terrible with this i sleep with my mobile phone i have it in my pocket all day literally on my body and i have it next to my bed and I look at it before I fall asleep and I look at it when I wake up, I look at it before I say good morning to my wife sometimes. And I think what has happened to my mind, I've become this completely person dominated by the spectacle. Um, so that's all pretty frightening. And it's been a pretty frightening year for that stuff. If you look at it from that point of view. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of, <laughs> there's a lot of stuff going on in our psyche, I think in terms of the, you know, we, I don't think we know quite what's happening to the human psyche um, because of this strange acceleration of digital communication and the way that it's at once intimate and distant at the same time is really strange. Um, I think that there's a good chance that a part of our psyches is, is in trauma because of that collectively. I really do. Um, I think it's, I think it's, a, yeah, I think it's a, psychological challenge very much i agree on that at all i think, I and I think, and I th I think i think there is an of it there is a challenge to personal freedom and freedom in society and i think that you know there's that we have to be really vigilant against that anyway i say that actually a very much a positive example since i know like you mentioned it before you collaborate with your wife uh, so there's a very positive example, not only of a romantic relationship, but also of a fruitful collaboration between professionals. And I was wondering, how do you actually collaborate together? Well, it's very easy. I mean, I, it's, it's great for me because she's the best poet in the house. I mean, she's the, I, think, I think she's the best poet in the country. So it's, it's lucky for me to be able to collaborate with her. I, um, really organically, I mean, Greta and I met actually because one of my poems was going into a book that she was editing uh, of contemporary love poetry in 2013, maybe. And we actually met to discuss the poem that was going in the book and the editing of the poem and and um we started writing poetry together the, the day we met actually we did that before anything and 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 we started writing poetry together to study something which is um you know why poetry is not normally written by collaboration because it seems it's 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 a strange thing about poetry if you think about it um music as an art form is so dependent on collaboration you know we know I mean, we know having heard their solo stuff that Keith Richards and Mick Jagger are much better collaborating than they are working apart, right? So why would poetry go through um, centuries and be a, a, an art form of the individual only? Well, there were some experiments by the Swedish in France in 
um, the 1920s, but in the sort of 1890s, turn of the century, um, 1920s, 1922, I think, Andre Breton, Paul Elwar, and René Clark published some books of poetry that were collaborative. Um, in English poetry, very few collaborations. So we, we thought, oh, let's give it a try and see what the process is like. And actually, it's really interesting because if you try to write together, I mean, on one keyboard and one page, you become conscious of the way you write and the things that you always do and the sort of habits you have in a way that you don't if you're writing on your own. And so we found that process really helpful for individual creative processes and, and really ple ple pleasurable because in a way being a writer or being an artist is a lonely job, you know? <laughs> and it's really nice to work with someone um, sometimes. So uh, yeah, with, that happened with us really naturally and we collaborate on uh, film projects together and, and you know, we become each other's editors in a really natural way. And Greta is a really, this is the kind of poet who's like, a, it's like a really talented soccer player, you know, and I'm, I have to work a little bit harder. So I'm like the, you know, I don't know. She's, she's just, it's really great. She's a, she, she has real natural talent and it's a thrill to work with her really. Robert, what? sorry, Elena, I, because he was talking about this uh, matter of co-creation mm -hmm. and, and collaboration, which is the basis of our program. We're, mm. we're working for 2021 in Basel um, on the concept of coexistence, mm. cohabitation and collaboration. So how do we exist on the same planet at the same time, but we can all also don't uh, engage with each other? And how do we move from this coexistence to a collaborative process? Mm -hmm. And I'm very interested in, in this, and especially in this period, I saw that also maybe thanks to the digital platforms, there is a much uh, higher uh, number of uh, collaborations within artists in terms of research, in terms of uh, sharing practices, sharing uh, resources. And I think that this is a very interesting moment because um, in, in the last century, the individual, the artistic individual was very relevant, yeah. but now it's kind of, uh, going and out, becoming less and less relevant and collectiveness is coming back to, to, to the stage. What do you think? Yeah, one thing that Greta and I are doing next year, planning and working on right now is, is to do direct a feature film where we'll direct it as a collaboration. And actually the two of us and maybe a third person because we want to investigate this idea of the ego of the, the director, the auteur. I mean, I don't, I mean, we, we have a slight suspicion that that's kind of a fake idea, you know, especially in a medium like film that is really collaboration. With making a film, you have a collaboration between all of the 20 people working and it really is really collaborative. Um, I think it's a bit of an old fashioned affectation to think there would be a director. I mean, and we're, we're, we're pitching this project and we're fundraising for this project and we're speaking to people and, and they're, they sometimes look at you as if you're crazy. Um, but, you know, we're saying, we, I mean, we suspect the idea of having one director is kind of a fake idea. So let's see. Um, I mean, let's see if the film is good or if it's a disaster. But um, I think it's good to challenge all of those um, preconceptions, you know, and I think it's, I think it's interesting. I mean, at the end of the day, um, anything that gives you a sort of a bit of extra energy, new direction, inspiration um, is, is really great, I think. Um, do you have a specific process you, you follow when in your art making or in your collaboration with your wife, perhaps? Well, in my art making these days, since it's hard to travel, I get someone, the curator to send me a photograph of the wall. And then I stare at the wall for two hours, I'm trying to think up some words. Uh, no, I mean, I used to, I mean, I used to, I used to have a, a process of going to a place, um, visiting the site, looking into local history, if it's, a you know, if, uh, working, uh, maybe something to do with the history of the, uh, religion and society in the place, all of these things. Um, 
No, I'm, I mean, I'm being slightly ironic there. I'm always trying to make the text and the, the object or the painting with text or the drawing with text or the light sculpture with text or the billboard with text work as an object. Um, so that's a slightly hard thing to describe, but it, but you know, the graphic form should be correct for what it says, for the length of the words, all these things should feel graphically right. And that's something that probably comes from um, the discipline of concrete poetry more than from anything else. Just in February, one of the last festivals I was involved in was called the, the Klangfarben in Munich, organized, organized um, uh, by a sort of European concrete poetry collective. And it was the festival of visual poetry. And the idea of, you know, where poetry becomes visual, where poetry and contemporary art meet, what's the border between concrete poetry and text art, all of those things, I think I find really interesting questions. And sometimes I, I work in a gap between them, between text art and concrete poetry. And, you know, so, the, so it, it can be both things or it can be neither one thing or another, really. And um, uh, with Greta, the working process is really organic. You know, we have lots of ideas going around in the house and we share ideas and then we'll hit on something that we want to work on together. Um, uh, the, yeah, I mean, does that answer the question? I'm not sure. I thank you for that. Uh, I was wondering, what is the role of the fire in your work? Because I know fire. that you use both lights and, and fire. Yeah, well, the fire is like, this is sort of like from my indigenous culture, right? So uh, in Celtic culture in Scotland and Ireland, before the arrival, let's say, of uh, of Protestant Christianity, so before the Reformation. So in Scotland, that means from before around 1680. Um, there was a long tradition of pagan fire celebration, which would mark the solstices. It would, it would mark um, the winter solstice, the spring equinox, the summer solstice, and the autumn equinox. And they were sort of to do with being connected to the rhythm of the land, to do with um, really to do with thanking the old pagan gods for the harvest and the summer. And we had our own god of the sun who was called Lu, spelled L-U-G-H, and he would have a fire festival on August the 1st. Anyway, around 1660, 1670, in Scotland, we had a very hard reformation, quite a fundamentalist reformation led by a guy called John Knox. And he was a student of John Calvin in Geneva. And he went to Geneva and he came back, like many disciples, he came back with a, a more hardline version of the Reformation that was happening in Geneva. And he destroyed all the art in the churches, he destroyed all the stained glass windows, he banned music in the churches, he was a Puritan, right? Um, he banned music in the churches, they began to burn innocent women as witches if they were involved in pagan practice, all those things. He banned the fire festivals, which were still happening. Um, so the first fire poem I did was in 2013, and I did it in Edinburgh as part of the Edinburgh Fire Festival, and I did it in the garden of John Knox. So I did it in the garden of the headquarters of the Church of Scotland, because I wanted to make a little tiny bit of pagan revenge against the Puritans who had banned the fire festivals. So that was kind of a cheeky part of it, but really to try to reconnect with that kind of idea of solstice celebration, equinox celebration, and being connected with the seasons and the land and the light and the sun and the sun. Um, I'm working on a project for next year with Little Sun, which is a a solar a solar product that Oliver Eliasson designed, which is um, and they're working in developing countries to give people access to solar powered light who don't have access to, you know, ele mains electricity. And I'm working on an idea with them for the solstice in the summer to raise awareness for, for solar power and its importance ahead of the, the COP climate conference in Glasgow in November next year. So, you know, it's tied into that whole idea of connection to the land and the solstice and the equinox and the passing of time. Thank you. And it was really also performative. Uh, I hosted um, 
yeah, we did one. This, do you remember Interni in 2015? And, and what struck me and what um, made me choose the, that, that, that specific work, which if you remember, was a work around migration. Remember, Europe was a refuge for our hearts. All Europe, said, all Europe must be everywhere a refuge for the brokenhearted. Uh, yeah. And then <laughs> England didn't. <laughs> I mean, yeah. looking back then, I mean, then I was campaigning for England and the UK to take in more refugees from the Middle East because we were taking, we were still taking in so few compared to our European neighbours. And, and, you know, at that point, we never expected the disaster of Brexit. But <laughs> Yeah, exactly. And, and I remember the, the strength of the performativity of the action, uh, which for me was the most because interesting thing, the performativity of the artist in, uh, in fight, in the fight with the fire. Now, yeah. already yeah. to say, when I, when I presented you to our uh, CEO and I told them what you did in internally they were scared about the fire uh, to, to be and actually I was scared but I was also very uh, attracted by the fire the idea of not having the, the artwork anymore yeah. to have to have the ashes of the artwork yeah I like the ashes of the artworks too I think it's ceremonial in a way that's ancient for us you know I think lots of indigenous cultures had fire ceremonies as part of their religious practice or their pagan practice and I think that it brings back those memories. But also I remember Linda, that was a very cold and wet night and it was really hard to get it on fire. <laughs> and I was standing there in the rain with the thing. And it's, you know, they're not- The weather again, not the weather. But they are in that sort of Joseph Boy sense of the word actions. So they're kind of, um, they have that slight performance element. And uh, sometimes the action is just trying to make the fire burn in, in the rain. But they always have a slightly different sense of ceremony to them um that was a fun that was a, i loved that festival it was really good fun to come there yeah yeah it was a yeah a ceremony i think the rituals are very important nowadays are again very important because we don't have them anymore we don't have anymore the ritual to go to theater we don't have anymore the ritual to have a dinner together a conviviality uh, sharing a space so rituals are becoming more and more relevant because we miss them yeah and we see the value of them i think when they're absent for some time yeah. hopefully they're just absent for a short time i mean hopefully yeah uh elena do you yeah. have other questions or well actually uh i wanted to comment on what you just said as well because i think it's brilliant the idea of fire since uh, it uh, underlines also how everything is temporary so we're not very much used to acknowledge that uh, everything actually is temporary and i think it's a brilliant way of describing it since it brings back the memory and the ancient wisdom oh. The last question I'd like to, to ask you is actually if you are already working on something new, if you've got plans for the future. Um, yeah, I'm working on lots of things. This week I was working on this project with Little Sun, which is Olafur Alison's solar company. Um, for the Hopefully, hopefully we'll, we'll do a poem in 12 different places across the world on the summer solstice of next year. Um, with one line, one line of the poem happening at the same solar moment in each place, just before dusk. So beginning in Australia, moving on to uh, East Africa, going to Turkey, going to Berlin, going to West Africa, London, going to the Americas. And that would be like one poem that happens in 12 places in one day. That's what I've been working on this week. What else am I working on? Uh, working on a film project with Greta. I'm working on paintings in my studio. I became, you know, I started out as a painter. I started painting actually. And I had the last maybe four or five years, I've gone back to the question of painting um, for the same reason as you're talking about, for, to have a meditative ritual process that I don't necessarily have if I'm producing a bigger work and that's collaborative like that. 
Um, uh, what else? Yeah, those things. Thank you. And you are working to come to Milano. <laughs> I really want I to hope to before the end of the. I really want to come and visit you. I want to. I really want to come and visit my 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 best friend in Italy, Fabio Pagliari. He lives in Milano. He's <laughs> He's a great photographer, Linda. You must check out the work of Fabio Pagliari. Okay. Anyway, he sent me a picture today, yesterday, and he was outside of the of Baza with the piece behind him. So I'd love to come and we all have a big dinner together. I mean, I love Milan and I love coming. It's a city that I come to at least twice a year and have done for the last 15 years of my life. So it's really, it's sad to have... Uh, I'm, Greta and I love Italy too. She has Italian heritage and we come to Italy lots. This year we had one weekend in Venice, that was it. And we really miss coming. So hopefully next year we're spending a lot of time in Italy and we're having lots of amazing dinners together and that can be our ritual. Yeah, yeah, I, I hope so. And I, yeah, we, we wait for you and we will do a live moment of uh, celebration of, of the installation. I, I want to, send, to thank Elena for thank her presence. She is a critique but also an artist so uh, it's also interesting how these uh, professions link and blend and mix together and uh, Elena works also for our Tribune and uh, she sent us very beautiful questions to, to, to Robert and we decided to involve her because uh, it's not so easy to receive beautiful questions from. <laughs> the questions for our Tribune are fantastic Elena, they're really um compelling it's so good i couldn't answer them quickly so it's taking a little bit longer because the questions are good that's why thank you no worries about that actually i was really amazed by your work because um, i think it's very much layered and uh from a first glance maybe may look uh, that forgive me for the words i would say simple but then once you understand it you understand also the complexity and the poetry in itself of it, which I think is wonderful. And I'm, I'm really jealous of the beautiful gift you did to your wife for the wedding. I mean, nobody's ever thought of, you know, dedicating me such a beautiful sentence and setting it on fire as well. That was brilliant. What did it say? It said, um, salvage paradise. It said, salvage paradise, love is the weather, daydreams forever. I See, <laughs> great. <laughs> we also had the, the 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 poetry. We end with the poetry, with a poem. Thanks a lot, Elena. Thanks a lot, yeah. Robert. I invite all the audience, the people, to come to Baze and see the artwork. Uh, our place is publicly closed, but is lively open. We are working. We work on our invisible playground to make it visible. Uh, eventually. Um, I thank you, then I switch back to, Italy, to Italian and uh, e voglio salutare tutte le persone che sono state con noi per questi 40 minuti, ci eravamo dati 40 minuti per raccontare il lavoro di Robert Montgomery per capire insieme perché vogliamo partire da quel lavoro per raccontare quello che stiamo facendo e con chi lo stiamo facendo e come vogliamo aprirlo uh, a tutti quelli che vorranno partecipare, collaborare con noi alla creazione del programma futuro di base. Vi aspettiamo eh, il 17, eh, c'è un altro eh, incontro, eh, chi decide il destino della città, chi decide il futuro della città. E, mh, è un incontro, è un progetto legato ad un percorso che abbiamo fatto lungo tutto lo scorso anno sul processo di immaginazione delle città e che vedrà eh, vari stakeholder, vari eh, amici, colleghi, compagni di questo percorso ragionare insieme su quale eh, è il destino della città di Milano e quale è il destino delle città in generale, come riprogettiamo la città, come la viviamo insieme, come torniamo ad abitarla. So, thank you very much again and uh, we see you on uh, the FB uh, channel of Basle next uh, uh, 17th of the December. Thank you very much. Goodbye. <laughs>